So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Chris Jackson, Senior Vice President with Ipsos' political polling team. Chris, you have the floor. Thank you, Ellen. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our February Inside Track. Uh, we have a lot of great data <clears throat> to share with you today. I am joined, as usual, by Sarah Feldman, our senior data journalist, and let's just dive right in. Um, but as Ellen said, if you do have any questions uh, throughout, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A field of the uh, GoToMeeting application to log those questions at any time, and Sarah and I'll come back to those at the end and answer as many as possible. So the agenda will follow the, the normal agenda that you may be familiar uh, if you've joined us in the past. I'll talk a little bit about the main issues, the things that are animating the American public debate, and then I'll hand it over to Sarah to do a little bit of a deeper dive into our latest data on how Americans are viewing the economy, uh, a number of other issue areas that we have current data on. We have, of course, Ipsos is producing a lot of ongoing public opinion data. Indeed, we actually have a couple of polls that came out just this morning that aren't featured in here yet that we can speak to a little bit as well uh, on the Alabama IVF decision. And then finally, Sarah will hand it back to me to talk about the 2024 election, uh, what our data is saying there, and our initial sort of forecasting of what we think is likely to happen in November. So let's dive into the main issues first. And I think we have something a little bit interesting with the main issue uh, this month. I, first off, as you may uh, remember from some of our previous presentations, we like to share the CARE-O-Meter, the Ipsos CARE-O-Meter with you. This is a, a, a survey vehicle that is being run jointly by our public affairs and marketing teams where we ask Americans essentially about a series of events. Do they know about these events? Are they familiar with them? And how much do they care about these events, right? How familiar are they or how impactful are they with their lives? And this is really a way to understand how much our news events actually breaking through into a regular American sort of common awareness. Because uh, a lot of times you'll see something and maybe it breaks through, maybe it doesn't. And that actually explains, I think, a lot of the uh, trajectories of, of debates or issues in the country about sort of what is and is not breaking through. Uh, we can see, uh, for instance, that the Biden administration student loan forgiveness uh, is something that people are aware of and care about uh, President Trump being fined a record amount for fraud by a New York court. Also something people know and care about. And then the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl also in that no care space. Um, equal in the no area, but people care less is about Taylor Swift being at the Super Bowl. Uh, this is something we actually see as pop culture things tend to break through. People are aware of a lot of pop culture things, but don't necessarily care as much about them. Um, and by care, I mean, it impacts them on sort of their day-to-day -day lives. They may care and like they're interested in it, right, standpoint. Uh, but then there's a lot of things that don't really break through. People aren't aware of, but when they hear about it, they care a lot about it. So for instance, things like uh, President Trump saying that he'd let Russia do whatever it wants with NATO, uh, Democratic candidate winning the special election to replace George Santos, uh, special counsel Robert Hur's reports on Biden, uh, you know, a number of things that just don't quite break through at the same level, even if, you know, if you're sort of a, a political nut, you might see a lot of conversation about don't actually resonate as much with the regular folks. Uh, next slide. So then uh, we go to our main issue, and you'll notice maybe a little bit of a different in our issue set this month. Uh, we've added in a new issue based on a lot of research we've been doing that I'll actually show some of in a moment. Uh, we've added in political extremism or threats to democracy to our uh, main issue battery. This is, a, of course, this question in our core political is one we've been tracking for over a decade. We haven't really changed it much in that time, but we felt that it was actually missing a, a key dynamic, a key dimension in how people are thinking about politics. And indeed, we added this one in and it's jumped up to the top of the list, uh, really a three-way statistical tie with the economy, which has been the number one issue in immigration, uh, which has been climbing up sort of the importance list the last few months. So, so we really are seeing three issues dominating sort of what Americans care about, the economy, political extremism, immigration. Uh, and these three issues are 
in some ways probably going to be the things that the election are going to be sort of fought on. And indeed, if you're paying attention, you'll see there is a lot of people, a lot of conversation already happening. President Biden and Democrats are very focused on uh, threats to democracy, extremism, you know, the potential uh, damage that a second Trump administration, they say, would cause, whereas sort of more um, uh, Donald Trump, MAGA sort of people are very much more focused on immigration. Indeed, uh, Trump sabotaged an immigration deal that potentially might have passed the Congress to make sure that the issue uh, stayed alive, stayed something that he could campaign on. And then there's sort of a, the economy, a perennial issue that sort of everybody cares about. Nikki Haley has been talking a lot about the economy uh, in recent weeks, uh, you know, been a real focus for for sort of uh, more moderate Republicans uh, or, or less uh, less activist Democrats uh, continue to be. And then there's a number of other issues that are further down that issue landscape that aren't necessarily uh, at that top tier, but are probably going to still be important things. All right, next slide, Sarah. Um, so this next slide is actually showing some of the experimentation we've been doing a little bit behind the scenes to get a handle on how Americans are thinking about the issues driving the country. So this is, was from a split sample survey. Essentially, we fielded at the same time with different versions of the, the same question, but different versions of the answer options. Um, sample A is our traditional main issue question. You can see here, immigration is the number one issue, economy is the number two issue, and then a number of things are sort of in the mid single digits. Uh, and actually the other on this particular option is pretty high as well, about 15%, though it's not on the screen. Um, and, you know, again, we knew from examining sort of our uh, other specify or open-ended versions of this question that this idea of uh, political extremism, this idea of threats to democracy was uh, driving a lot of people. So we did actually sample C, the version on the far right, where we actually made explicit Donald Trump and Joe Biden as potential issues. And you can see actually that when we do that, almost a quarter of Americans say Donald Trump is the most important problem facing the country. 13% say Joe Biden. Immigration actually drops almost in half. So that suggests about half of the people saying immigration is their number one issue or actually maybe a little bit more uh, just sort of anti-Biden and Democrats. Um, the economy about the same, not too different. Uh, and then sort of the other issues again, sort of further down the list. So what we've decided to do is our sort of path forward is using this sample B, this middle uh, characterization, characterization, which we think uh, captures a lot of the people that are concerned with Donald Trump, but also a lot of independents who are maybe not quite as politically motivated um, while still having immigration, which again is much more of a Republican centric issue uh, and the economy. So you'll, you'll sort of see the previous slide is going to be what we're tracking moving forward, but how you ask the question actually does sort of change up a little bit about what the data that we see back is. So it's a really interesting understanding of the sort of internals of doing uh, opinion research. Uh, and with that, I think I want to hand it over to Sarah to talk about the economy. We have a lot of data uh, to share with you on that. The economy, again, sort of a, still one of those top issues, one of those sort of animating issues uh, around the election. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, as we've talked about in a number of these presentations, the economy and consumers' relationship to it remains in this middling, kind of tepid spot. Here we're looking at our consumer confidence index going back to 2002, and consumers remain fairly meh on the economy, um, even as the macroeconomic indicators have shown more positive signs, inflation is coming down, unemployment remains in a low spot. There's been a lot of robust job numbers that have come out. GDP growth has seemed positive um, in the past few months, but you know, consumers aren't really paying attention to that, aren't really noticing and feeling that in their day-to-day -day lives, and that's coming through in our consumer confidence data. Though there are some signs that perhaps you know, some of those positive 
indicators are seeping through into other facets of the consumer confidence index. So here we're looking at how confident Americans feel about their financial future. And we see the confidence in their financial future rise to pre-pandemic levels, something we haven't seen in a few years. So, you know, overall, Americans are feeling not great, not terrible about the economy. There are some signs that perhaps people are feeling a little bit more optimistic than they were before, but what's really important to keep in mind and remember as we parse through why Americans have been so kind of tepid, lukewarm, meh on the economy is to ground this in just overarching trends in American public opinion, and that is that Americans are largely dissatisfied with the systems that they live in, and that includes the economy. Majorities of Americans, regardless of partisanship, really don't doesn't don't feel that the economy works for them. They don't really trust the institutions, the experts, the mechanisms of the economy. Um, they don't really feel like that it's fair and that they that it has their back. And we see that in our global populism data. A 28 country survey we fielded and released a week and a half ago. Really interesting piece of research. And in that we see that majorities do not feel that the political and economic elite care about them. Majorities feel that the economy is rigged and that experts really don't understand them in their lives. So this large sense, there's this overarching sense of distrust in institutions and experts, and that frames a lot of opinion that we see around the economy. And indeed, that's not just specific to the economy, that goes on, that low trust environment goes on to frame a lot of opinion patterns and dynamics we see across a number of different issues. So getting into some of the rest of those issues, our issue landscape, here we're looking at our Axios, Axios Ipsos American Health Index, which we released last week. And we've been tracking attitudes around American public health for the past year or so with Axios. And each wave we asked, what people feel the number one threat is to American public health at the moment. And pretty consistently, we see opioids and fentanyl take that number one spot with more Americans feeling that that is a pressing issue right now. Obesity is also a top concern, as is mental health, which is a new item we added this, this wave. Access to guns or firearms really rises and falls um, as and, and follows the cycle, the news cycle. If we see a mass shooting event or gun violence really prevalent in the news, we see concern about access to guns or firearms rise and then fall as that falls away from the news cycle. But that's all to say that Americans are noticing a wide variety of problems when it comes to public health. There's no one single issue that really captures the public's attention. There are a lot of really pressing issues the public is noticing. And with that, you know, are Americans noticing any solutions around these issues? And the answer is largely is no in the, in the public sector. Very few people feel that the government makes their health and well-being a priority. That's true regardless of partisanship. Very few Americans feel that the country is really prepared to deal with these widespread health crises that they're noticing their day-to-day -day lives. And very few people feel that the country is prepared to deal with another pandemic. So Americans are really noticing a lot of problems, but not seeing a lot of solutions from government, from the public sector. And that goes on to frame who they turn to when they need help, when they need information. And we see, as it relates to public health, people turning to their close social inner network. So that's their friends, their families, their personal personal doctors. Vast majorities of Americans turn to these sources for information about health, their health. Majorities are still turning to health institutions, government institutions like the FDA, like the CDC, but just at lower rates. Um, and I think that really speaks to those parts, the parts and fray these institutions have been brought into, the CDC with the pandemic, the FDA with a court cases around methoprostenone. Um, that has engendered uh, a sense of distrust among some Americans around these institutions. And that means that when they need help, when they need information, they're not going there. They're not going to the government, the public sector. They are going to other sources, their close internet work. And that offers this kind of run through of public health that we've just done really offers a really compelling case study for how Americans operate in a low trust environment. They see a lot of problems, they don't see a lot of solutions, and that goes on to inform who they trust and who they turn to when they need help. And one of the places we've noticed across a number of our different surveys and tracking over the past few years that people turn to when you know the public sector maybe isn't stepping up fully or they don't feel that the public sector 
sector is stepping up fully is um, the private sector and their employer. And we can see that specifically around mental health. Um, so as I said, mental health is one of the pressing issues Americans are noticing. They're not seeing a lot of government action on it. Um, but they do, Americans are turning to their employer, are turning to the private sector for some action here. And this study we're looking at is some great work we did with NAMI, where we asked employees how they feel about mental health in the workplace and their experiences with that. And we can see that employees who feel their company prioritizes mental health are much more likely, much less likely, I'm sorry, to, to feel burnt out by their job, to feel overwhelmed, to feel that they're productivity is suffering or to even consider quitting than employees who don't feel that their company is prioritizing mental health. And given all that upside that's coming through in the data, it's worth asking why some people don't feel comfortable engaging with mental health at work. And there are two real pressing reasons why. One, there's just baseline stigma around mental health that people are sensitive to. Um, there's fear of seeming weak, of any stigma about bringing up mental health issues. And the second pressing reason people don't feel comfortable talking about mental health at work really revolves around workplace culture. If employees don't see their coworkers, their manager talking about mental health, if they're afraid of retaliation or losing status, they're reasonably not going to feel comfortable talking about, about mental health at work. And that's all to say that workplace culture goes a long way in framing how comfortable people feel uh, discussing and engaging with this issue in the workplace. And senior leadership and C-suite really have a big and important role to play in making people feel comfortable in engaging with these issues. In the survey we did with NAMI, workers who felt their C-suite and senior leadership really cared about them were much more likely to discuss mental health with their coworkers, their teammates, their managers, HR, even with the senior leadership and C-suite themselves. Um, and as we mentioned in that first slide on the NAMI data that, you know, there's a lot of upside for workplaces and employers to um, engage with mental health and the mental health of their employees. Um, and that really is speaking to some of the gaps that are we're seeing in the public sector around mental health that some um, Americans are noticing and feeling and kind of turning to the private sector and employers to take up some of that, to take up that mantle. So that's all to say the low trust environment um, takes focus sometimes away from the public sector, puts it on the private sector for some issues. And that, you know, again, grounds us, centers us again in this low trust environment and kind of the dynamics that we're seeing around it, given how important it is in framing American public opinion. So here we're turning again to our populism data, our populism survey that we released a couple weeks ago. Um, and what we, what uh, overarching theme of the data is that populism really remains strong in the world today across 28 countries, there's a widespread sentiment that really the system is broken, that things aren't working. Right here on the slide, we're looking at this data through the lens of our system is broken index, which is an index we Ipsos made in the early 2000s in Latin America and then brought to the US in 2015 ahead of the 2016 election. And this index is really capturing average agreement to questions on whether people feel institutions are working for them, whether people feel the economy, politics works, and their tolerance for leaders to break norms to answer to some of these problems they're seeing in their day-to-day -day life. And across a number of key markets and key countries where we see major elections on the ballot this year, like Mexico, like the US, like the UK and South Africa, we see this widespread sense that things aren't working. And that goes on to frame and really comes through in a lot of different parts of the survey. Um, so the sense, the sense of malaise, the sense that their country is in decline is really prevalent across many of these major countries with elections this year. And just to take a step back for a moment, I think it's worthwhile to remember that this year, 2024, 70 plus countries will be going to the ballot box and engaging in the electoral process. They'll be voting. Um, so the world in 2025 could look very different than the world now when it comes to political leadership and the issues and prioritize, priorities that that leadership is acting on. 
So paying attention to the sense of malaise, paying attention to this low trust environment and the patterns and dynamics in behavior that we see come out of it is really important because it goes on to frame a lot of the main issues and the dynamics around the main issues. So we talked about the economy, we talked about public health, but this is also true for an issue like immigration, which is one of the main issues that Chris talked about at the top with us. Um, when it, in this populism survey, we ask about whether people feel that when jobs are scarce, employers should prioritize hiring people of this country, the country of the respondent, over immigrants. We can see in the US that about half of Americans agree with that sentiment. And now that is down relative to 2016, but still represents a very sizable share of the public. Um, and it is a sentiment that comes across in many of the different countries with elections this year. And that's all to say that when thinking through elections, it's important to be listening for how campaigns and candidates are communicating with voters around this low trust environment, around the sense that things aren't working. That's what's mo motivating people. That's what campaigns are trying to speak to and candidates are trying to speak to. So listen and have an ear for that in the year ahead. And with that, I will kick it over to Chris, who will run through our 2024 update section. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah, the uh, populism data, which is, uh, again, from a, a global report we put out last month, is really interesting, some really good stuff. Uh, and I think it's a um, really important sort of piece of background context to understanding what's happened in the United States, because really two thirds of this country right now are in this sort of anti-establishment, anti-elite, anti-system mode. That means that anyone who is sort of seen as that establishment is going to have a little bit of a headwind against them. And indeed, that's, I think, part of what's happening with Joe Biden. He's very much part of the institution. He's been in Washington pretty much his whole life. He's the current incumbent president. And I think that's one of the reasons we see his approval ratings uh, remain stuck at a relatively low level, 37% in our most recent Ipsos core political tracking uh, that actually came out just earlier this week. Uh, and, you know, this is partially maybe significantly uh, a factor of inflation, of, of gas and uh, food prices, particularly which we know are the two pieces of inflation that consumers are most uh, directly familiar with, the ones that sort of have the biggest impact in their views. Uh, but also this sort of, you know, idea that people are looking for some sort of change and Biden really isn't change necessarily uh, seen as change. He's instead sort of seen as continuity. Um, and I think that's pushing against him as well, because I think, you know, within the Democratic Party, uh, his base, there is, you know, probably half of it that is sort of in that much more of a, you know, big change kind of camp, tends to be much more sort of Bernie Sanders or AOC uh, friendly. Um, and it's just sort of weakening some of his support, weakening some of his numbers. He's having a, a bit of a harder time keeping the Democratic base behind him. Uh, in a way that actually Donald Trump didn't with Republicans. Donald Trump was able to keep Republicans more consistently behind him throughout his presidency. So, you know, Biden continues to sort of see these relatively weak or anemic approval ratings. And that's important because uh, the president's approval rating is sort of the best barometer of their standing in the public and how they're likely to do in the general election. And 37 percent is actually a pretty weak level for an incumbent president it would actually probably put him as a bit of a, of the uh, underdog uh, if the election were held today. Uh, next slide. And his approval rating is uh, also being driven by sort of these sort of consistent concerns about his age. This is from an ABC poll we did uh, earlier in February where we asked Americans if Biden's too old, if Trump's too old, or if both of them are too old. And actually what most Americans told us is that both of them, 59% saying that they're both too old. Um, but you can see there is a significant uh, chunk, 27% saying that only Biden is too old, not Trump. These are mostly Republicans saying this. Um, and this is also a place where you see some of that partisan discipline. Republicans are much more likely to say Trump's too old, not Biden, or uh, Biden's too old, not Trump. Whereas Democrats are much more likely to say they're both too old. They're not quite as, you know, loyal to the party line um, uh, as, as Republicans are. But this is another sort of piece of headwind uh, for Joe Biden as he sort of seeks re-election. One of the things that's making it harder for him to sort of build his approval rating back up, like he probably needs to do if he's going to be successful in November. Next. 
Uh, another piece or, uh, or sort of really a contributing factor is the HER report that came out uh, earlier this month. This was special counsel HER's investigation of Biden's handling of classified documents uh, after he left the vice presidency. Um, this has been treated as a, you know, as a sort of like Biden's equivalent of what Trump was doing, keeping documents at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, the report came out essentially finding that they couldn't, they wouldn't charge Biden with anything. Um, and the bigger news at the moment was that uh, her said it was because he thought the jury would think of Biden as a forget, forgetful, well-meaning old man. And that sort of restarted the whole old conversation. Um, but when we ask Americans uh, what they think of the actual report, um, you know, half of the country thinks that Biden was treated fairly when they decided uh, not to press charges against him. Uh, a, a quarter said uh, that they disagreed and a quarter said they didn't know. Uh, that is, of course, driven by partisanship with Democrats much more likely to say it was the, a fair decision. Um, then when we ask if Biden received special treatment, uh, we see partisanship also sort of playing out here, but a similar 50% of Americans saying that he did, uh, with Republicans saying he got special treatment. Um, but then the Democratic sort of pushback uh, that Biden was mistreated by a prosecutor, a Republican prosecutor, fewer people agreed with that. Many more said that they didn't know, which I think reflects the fact that the Her report actually didn't really break into popular awareness, which is what we showed you at that early beginning slide with the carometer that uh, even though it sort of dominated conversation in Washington, D.C. for a week, uh, it didn't actually break through for regular Americans in any sort of big way. Next. Um, another issue, this is not Biden-centric, this is about Donald Trump, is about Trump's potential immunity to the many, many uh, cases being brought against him around the country. Uh, he has appealed to the Supreme Court. They heard arguments but have not decided yet. Um, we asked Americans, do they think that that decision is going to be made on the basis of law? politics or don't know and Americans are divided. Americans don't actually know, uh, don't have a clear idea of how the Supreme Court's gonna decide. Um, I think this essentially reflects that the decision hasn't happened yet. We'll repeat this question once it has. Um, but you can see some inclinations of the politics of it coming through with Republicans about half saying that they think it's gonna be based on law because they're assuming that uh, a conservative dominated Supreme Court will decide in their favor versus Democrats saying that'll be based more on politics because again, that conservative uh, majority of the Supreme Court would probably decide in ways that Democrats will not like. Next slide. Um, going back to Biden for a moment, this is uh, our ABC News questions on Biden, and this is a reflection of his overall approval rating, but this is on a couple of key issues. And you can see he's actually, when we ask about approval of his handling of some of these issues, doing a little bit worse than his overall approval rating. So the economy, 31% saying uh, they approve the job he's doing, uh, the Israel-Hamas conflict, 26%, the immigration at the border, 18%. Um, so these, again, are things pulling against Biden's overall standing. His his job performance is kind of underwater, uh, his approval rating. And really, again, for him to see improvements, he's going to need to see some of these numbers, some of these individual job aspects improve as well he's gonna some people are gonna need to think he's good at some part of his job basically uh and that's different than we saw early in his presidency where he got really good marks for instance on handling covid which was one of the main issues at the time um even as you know the economy uh wasn't necessarily the same issue so you know on the, particularly on the three key issues of the economy uh immigration and then politics and partisan uh extremism which is as we said one of the main issues he's going to need to be sort of seen as superior to trump on at least two out of those three issues and right now he's not right now uh the extreme political extremism is kind of a break even between him and trump and he's uh trump is seen as better on the economy and immigration so that again some headwinds for for the president next um so that so uh you know, I've talked a lot about Joe Biden, but I think this is going to be a little bit of a weird election um, because I do think it will be very much about Trump at the end of the day, that Trump is such a unique and polarizing figure uh, that he is going to actually dominate a lot of 
what ends up happening. And this is from a forthcoming study uh, done by the Ipsos MSU team from the candidate as a brand. This is essentially using some of Ipsos's brand evaluation tools on political candidates. And this particular question is where we asked people uh, how they would rate Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and a number of other political figures uh, on a one to 10 scale. And the thing I wanna point out to you is how Donald Trump uh, among all Americans actually has more people saying that he's perfect than Joe Biden does, about uh, four times as many, 8% to 2%. But he also has more people saying he's terrible, 46% to 37%. Uh, and Joe Biden actually has more people sort of rating him in the middle. Uh, and that, I think, is going to be sort of the key factor, right, is Donald Trump both has people who are absolutely devoted to him, but he also has a large number of Americans who are fearful of him. And Joe Biden is not uh, divisive in anything approaching similar fashions. Indeed, if you look at the middle of this table, you can see among Democrats and among Republicans, uh, while the two candidates are sort of a little bit viewed as mirror images, it's not a perfect uh, symmetrical image. So for instance, among Democrats, 87% give Donald Trump a terrible rating. So that would be a, a one on that one to 10 scale versus only 71% of Republicans giving uh, uh, Biden that terrible rating, right? So it's a weaker number of Republicans saying he's terrible, uh, more of them sort of saying poor, um, and at the other end, though, uh, you see more Republicans saying that Donald Trump is perfect, right? 19% uh, of Republicans saying that Trump is perfect versus only 8% saying that Biden is perfect. So, you know, again, Trump has a lot more people who are devoted to him than Biden does, at least twice as many among his base. So you have both Democrats much more fearful of Trump than Republicans are of Biden, but also Republicans more enamored of Trump than Democrats are of Biden. And that's why I think for a lot of reasons, this election is going to really end up being about what happens, how people view Donald Trump. And that's where this independence is actually kind of interesting, because you see here, um, independents don't particularly like either Biden or Trump, uh, but there is a much higher number of independents saying that they think Trump is terrible, and that might end up being the deciding factor for the election. Next, um, which brings us to just the horse race ballot early this early on, you know, eight months before the election. I don't think that the horse race, the head to head matchups mean a lot. Historically, they're not terribly good indicators of what's going to happen. Um, but we are seeing that Donald Trump continues to be in a little bit of a strong position, up three points in our polling. However, there's a lot of Americans who are undecided. There's a lot of potential variation that might happen. So I do think this is a very unsettled election environment right now. But yes, it does look like Donald Trump, if the election were held today, would probably be uh, the favorite. But next slide. Um, a poll is not necessarily how we view uh, a single national poll is not necessarily what's most important. Indeed, it's a the electoral system is built around the electoral college, which is really about what's happening at the states. So really paying attention to those state level polls, those sort of state level returns are going to be important. We're going to be doing that in an increasing level as we move forward. And there's really sort of three regions of the country that are going to be key. There's the Midwest, the Southeast, and the Southwest. These are really the same areas that have been very important in the last couple of election cycles. One interesting sort of thing is because of the 2020 redistricting, the Southwest and the Southeast actually have picked up electoral college seats. The Midwest lost three. So, you know, the center of gravity has moved a little bit to the South. Um, and, uh, you know, these are all essentially the states that were decided by less than 10 percentage points in the last election. They're the states that are likely to be competitive this cycle as well. So these are the ones to be paying attention to, uh, you know, as we move towards November. Next. Um, but finally, uh, at the last section of the presentation today is understanding how to forecast what's going to happen in November versus taking what a individual poll or even an aggregate of poll says is happening right now. Because remember, a poll is essentially a snapshot in time. It's how people feel today at this moment. People 
can change their mind. People are also oftentimes really bad at predicting their own behavior in the future. So here at Ipsos, we actually use a, a combinatorial method to forecast what's gonna happen using multiple inputs, using models, using sort of uh, trends, uh, big sets of data from elections around the world to, to sort of create a summary judgment of what we think is gonna happen. Next. Um, and what we're seeing right now is that most people are actually saying it's a little too early to call. This is a number of sort of professional forecasters or academics. Um, and you can see most of them right now are saying it's a toss up. It's too early to say uh, the CNN model, which is based on polling, is leaning Trump, but the rest are saying toss up or they haven't actually put out a prediction yet, though we'll share this with you, of course, as we update it and we see more uh, predictions as we get closer to the election. We'll also likely see that these people right now saying toss up will start making calls as we get closer to the election as well. Next. Ipsos's point of view, though, right now is that the election is, uh, again, at this moment in time, leaning a little bit Trump. Uh, this is uh, our indicators, our set of indicators, and actually the national column was from data that was actually before this week. Our most recent core political was a little bit worse for Biden. Um, then our last round of data, so it would actually maybe tilt a little bit more towards Trump. But this is essentially showing what we expect Biden's odds to be of running re-election um, based on various things, based on horse race polls, based on the base rate model, which is really built around Biden's approval rating. Uh, if the main issue is the economy versus if the main issue is political extremism, uh, fundraising numbers, which is really the only space that Biden is a consistent consistently ahead of Donald Trump or media attention, you know, the amount of headlines and stories being written about either of them. And really what we see is Donald Trump has got a marginal to sizable advantage in really most of these domains, except for, again, if the election really becomes around politics and extremism versus the economy or immigration um, and fundraising. And that sort of suggests to us that right now, particularly if you look at the electoral college in these swing states, Trump has probably got a marginal advantage at this particular moment in time because Biden's approval ratings are a little weaker in the swing states. The polling's a little worse for him in a lot of the swing states. Um, and again, the economy and immigration are not good issues for him right now. But, next slide, uh, The what is going to happen eight months from now may be different. And we actually sort of see three potential scenarios. Uh, there's the status quo that is essentially things continue like they are now that even though the economy seems to be improving by macroeconomic indicators, people still ve feel very discontent. Biden's approval rating remains relatively weak. Um, polls remain relatively competitive, if not slightly Trump friendly. Um, and the economy continues to be sort of the main issue. And if that happens, Trump is likely to be the favorite come November. However, if we see uh, some of the, the public opinion catch up to some of these trends, uh, we actually could potentially see a bit of a change in that. And we could see Biden's approval rating increase if people start feeling less economic inflation-based pressure. We could see democracy become more of the central main issue, uh, which is a more friendly territory for Biden. And if Biden's approval ratings improve, his polling will probably improve as well. And in that case, uh, Biden might actually end up being uh, the favorite come November. But there's also the chance of a black swan. This is an unforeseen event. Um, looking at the last couple of decades of American presidential elections, basically one time out of three, something happens in the election year that would have been unpredicted at the start of the year. This could be you know, a pandemic like in 2020. This could be a sharp recession like happened in 1992 after the first Gulf War. Um, or any other sort of number of things that might happen. And it's hard to predict what, what those sort of effects might be. Uh, so, you know, I think it is important just to, you know, we have the data, we have sort of where the trends are now, but there's always the possibility that something could come along and sort of shock those. Indeed, looking back at the past uh, couple decades of American history, that's happened actually more often than you would think. So what do we think is going to happen? So right now, uh, our outcomes, we think what's most likely going to happen in November is a narrow win for either Biden or Trump. We don't think that there's a high likelihood of a wave election. So like, you know, big changes and and sort of uh, the House or the Senate. But instead, it'll be sort of a small uh, victory by sort of small margins. We think the most likely scenario right now is 
at this moment in time, we'd say would be a narrow Trump win. Um, but again, that's something that is uh, subject to change based on sort of what those trends are looking at, uh, tr what the trends we'd be looking, watching over the next couple of months will be. Uh, but this, you know, is sort of our initial look at what we expect to happen come November and some of the potential outcomes from those. Uh, and I think that's uh, our last slide. So with that, uh, we will take uh, questions. So please, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and punch them into that Q&A field uh, of the uh, GoToMeeting application, and we will uh, go and see what's what. Um, all right, uh, first question is, I think asking about the main issue question, is this an open end that's coded or is it a close ended question? Um, what I showed was a, was from three close ended questions. We also had an open ended question, which as you would guess has a lot more things people were putting towards it, but that sort of political extremism component was one of the top themes that came out of the open end, which also figured into our decisions to uh, to um, sorry, to include that in our main issue tracking moving forward. Um, next question, uh, Sarah, maybe you can take this one. Uh, you referenced some data on the Alabama IVF decision uh, at the start. Uh, can you share that with us? Yeah, we just released some data with Axios this morning um, that found that Americans largely oppose uh, categorizing embryos as people um, and engendering them with the rights associated with that. Um, though, you know, we only found that a plurality of Americans were familiar with the Alabama court ruling. So certainly not a majority of Americans capturing, being captured by this issue, but given our fractured media environment, I mean, that is a pretty sizable share of the country that's paying attention to that. Um, next question, uh, what do you make of the large number of uncommitted voters in the Michigan election? Um, this happened, uh, the Michigan primary was yesterday, uh, and uh, in the Democratic primary, uh, a lot of uh, people who are angry at Joe Biden and were encouraging people to vote uncommitted, so essentially they didn't vote for him. Um, indeed, about 100,000 Michiganders uh, did vote that, um, did vote uh, uncommitted in the Democratic primary. Biden still got over 600,000 votes, so it's not like it's you know risking his ability to get the nomination or anything, but it's definitely a sign of discontent with him um, and is something that I think uh, he and his team are gonna be worried about moving forward because if you recall, Michigan is one of those battleground states, is one of those states that is pretty closely divided, closely fought, um, and if, you know, Biden is going to lose 100,000 votes in November, that's potentially the difference between winning and losing the state. Um, so, yeah, I do think, you know, it doesn't really make a big impact right now on him winning the nomination for the Dem Democratic Party, but is definitely going to be a big concern moving towards November, uh, trying to uh, reassure those potential allies, most of whom, uh, at least in reporting, are upset about his policies with the Israel-Gaza conflict and, and particularly their Arab Americans in Michigan who are uh, angry about Biden's sort of unequivocal support of Israel. Um, you're going to see probably a lot of sort of efforts to sort of assuage those people, make those people feel like Biden is listening to them and is, is sort of helping uh, push that conflict to a close. Um, though again, eight months from now, we will see. Um, let's see, next question. Uh, so this one's for Sarah. Is, is there anything from our economic data that is suggesting that Americans are feeling less pinched by inflation? That's a good question. Um, we're still seeing Americans report the high cost of goods is weighing on them. We see people say that goods cost more now than they did a year ago. That's their perception of it. Um, so it's still certainly hurting and really top of mind for most Americans in some consumer tracking we've done and in our consumer confidence index. 
Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, part of the reason we're still seeing this middling place that consumer confidence remains in. Yeah, and I think that's, it's an interesting sort of uh, mismatch between how mm -hmm. inflation is measured by sort of official statistics versus how people feel it. Um, you know, official statistics really is trying to sort of take what people spend all of their money on, right? So things like housing, which consumes, you know, a third to half of people's income is actually more, but it's not something most Americans think about. And, you know, if you own your home, it's not something, you know, inflation isn't really affecting you the same way um, as if you're a renter. So it isn't necessarily something people are feeling as much. Um, instead, what people see is energy, particularly gasoline and food prices, which, you know, together, actually make up only about 20 percent of people spending um if not a little less uh but it has an outsized importance and food particularly is the one area that we haven't seen inflation ease as quickly as in some of these other areas you know gas prices we've seen gas prices come down from the high of last year but food prices haven't i think that's one of the reasons there's this sort of disconnect between official inflation and cpi measures and how people are feeling um, it's it's really it's those grocery store bills that people are getting and are still seeing, you know, pretty high levels of uh, making it harder for people to sort of feel, even if, you know, some of the other things, you know, health care, housing, these sort of things have actually started to subside. People just aren't as familiar with it. They don't feel it the same way. Um, those are all the questions we have. If anyone else has a thing they'd like to send in quickly, we'd appreciate it. Um, but otherwise, we will start to wrap up. Um, our next webinar uh, will be March 28th. That'll be the next Inside Track. We'll be updating with uh, all of our sort of latest and greatest poll data. We have, uh, we'll have uh, Super Tuesday will have been decided by then. Uh, we'll have some of Ipsos's own uh, election polling data we'll be starting to produce and we'll be able to share by then. Uh, so, you know, please make sure to join us for that. I think the registration is available on the Ipsos website. All of this data is public, so you're certainly welcome to use or cite any of it. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Sarah or I. We're always happy to chat. Otherwise, have a great month. Uh, thank you for joining us and take care. Bye-bye.